Well, thank you, Renee. You took part of my speech, but I'll correct the mistakes. But it's pretty good. Steve was, um, first of all, let's go back to something Craig Conroy said. You grew up in Potsdam, you grew up, in, you saw real hockey. It was Clarkson hockey. You saw real players. There were Clarkson players. You're pretty humble because these, these guys were good. And every week we were big games. The games were St. Lawrence Clarkson, Potsdam Canton. But the real big game was Sunday at one o'clock on Hewison's rink at Corner Grove in Somerset. 20, 22 kids between the ages of six and 18 would play. And we start at one and be there at five o'clock. A lot of good things happened in that neighborhood. Three people are in this hall of fame. Two became NHL general managers. And over two dozen played college hockey. And Steve Riggs was the first. So Steve was truly a son of Potsdam, a son of the North Country. Absolutely quality person, humble to the core. Great athlete, better person. Played all the sports. Hockey was his love. Good baseball player. Good football player. By the time he graduated, he'd been captain of all three teams, president of student council, president of senior class. Probably got a wheelbarrow full of awards at commencement. The game I remember the most about Steve is, is I was a Bantam. We did win the state tournament, but we had a very young team. The team from Ottawa came to town with six or seven 16 year old kids, but half our team was 12. So the people who ran the program said, well, let's talk to Jack Corey, the high school coach, and see if Steve can play. So Steve played. It was an embarrassment. We won seven to three. Steve Riggs didn't get a goal. He thought he got seven. He got seven assists. And all the goals were within 12 inches of the open net. It was an embarrassment. He just had the puck all the time. And this team had broken the rule, and Steve was probably extra motivated. And all I can remember thinking about the game is Steve would get off the bench and go get the puck and bring it down the ice and set somebody up, and he'd miss the net and go get it again, set the same person up. So he was a class above the rest of us. Renee, you aren't quite right about shoveling snow, but in the ballpark, uh, when he was 14, his dad, Frank, uh, bought a green Willie's Jeep with a red plow. And at the age of 14, he allowed Steve plow all the driveways in the neighborhood. So Steve would come out at five in the morning, his best friend Buster, navigating from the passenger side, he'd, plug, he'd plow everybody's driveway. Well, I was the oldest boy in our house, so I liked that, because that meant I didn't have to go out and shovel it. He came back in college, same thing. He'd get up and plow everybody's driveway. And, um, so we're talking about Buster. He was a great athlete. Played by his own rules. He was the best center fielder in the neighborhood. He was a good wide receiver. Couldn't catch the ball. Very defensive back. Couldn't play hockey. Understood the game. He couldn't play hockey. He couldn't skate. He was a fox carrier. And everybody loved Buster. Steve said one day, if Buster dies, I'll cry like a baby. I said, Steve, if Buster dies, this entire neighborhood's going to cry like a baby. So I had to bring up Buster. So Steve then goes to Colgate. Uh, a little bit of a surprise, Colgate. Not that good a program, up and coming. And what Renee said that was true. In his sophomore year, they came to Potsdam. It was kind of a strange game because all the students were cheering for Clarkson. And the town people are cheering for Colgate. So Steve was on the team, and so was Dave Healy. He was from Boston. And when he scored the third goal in the middle of the third period, the building erupted. Students were silent. The town people erupted. And it was sort of, if you put that in a movie, they said, no, you'd never believe that guy comes back to his hometown and does that. So he had a real good career at Colgate. I think he averaged just under two points a game, which back in that day was a lot. Uh, captain of his team, all East. Um, did everything he should, should have to do. He graduated. His friends went out into the wide world and he went back to Potsdam in North Country. Took graduate courses in St. Lawrence because what he wanted to do was coach and teach and work with young people. And he did that. And he is probably the only person from Potsdam at that time who was allowed to teach and coach in Canton, our arch rival. 
And one year he turned that program around. They won the championship, a couple of tournaments, the league championship. And my cousin Jerry Hayes is here. And he still talks about the time going through the line on the, on the Potsdam side. And there's Steve Briggs coaching Canton. He said, that was a really weird feeling, coaching, shaking his hand. It was, it was Canton. But then it was a tough time for us, our age group, because of Vietnam. And Steve got drafted. He went to OCS, became a lieutenant. Uh, he and Bob tried out for the Olympic team. They didn't make it. At one time, he was stationed in Fort Devens. He started his own hockey team. Uh, my understanding is only a few of them were in the military, recruited from all the different ranks, and they played various senior teams around town. He knew when he got cut from the Olympic team that he was going to end up in Vietnam. So he left for Vietnam in early July 1968. He was killed eight weeks later on night march from a landmine. And if we, in our society, people talk about, remember certain events where they were, like every, our generation, remember where you were when John Kennedy got shot. Everybody remembers where you were when the Twin Towers got crashed into by the planes. Now, all Steve's friends can tell you where they were and they heard that Steve died. I was, it was a little bit after 12 noon on a Saturday and into my third week of basic training in Fort Jackson. And I still remember sitting there. I can tell you the color of the sky. Just saying there's something wrong here. This can't be possible. It wasn't shocked because we were Vietnam. We knew we all had friends. And uh, I just remember saying, this is not possible. Steve Briggs could be dead. But anyway, so... He, he died, you know, and I thought, I'm a believer that if you're part of the, your main part of the conversation, you're still here. And Steve's part of the conversation, always has been. Um, Fort Devens built a new building. They named it after Lieutenant Steve Riggs. Pretty unique because most buildings in the military are named after generals, not lieutenants. Uh, Colgate, um, well, I guess first of all, I'd say Postam. Postam put Steve in the inaugural class of their Hall of Fame. Uh, they have a Steve Briggs Leadership Award. One of their recipients is here is Steve Smalling. Uh, he hasn't been forgotten Postam. Colgate, Colgate did a lot for him. They have a leadership award in Steve's name. And I uh, would meet people who played at Colgate pro hockey, and I'd say to them, they didn't know the name Steve Briggs. Oh, yeah, I know the name Steve Briggs. Leadership board. I said, Well, you know, I don't see Briggs. How do you know Steve Briggs? Well, you grew up on the same street. And I feel myself being elevated in status in their eyes. And they always ask the same question. Is as good a person as they said? I said, probably better. Um, Colgate, uh, his classmates at the 25th reunion rebuilt the locker room, named it the Steve Briggs locker room. But Colgate needed a new rank. I may have the story a little wrong, but you get the gist of it. And they had some problems raising money for some reason. And Steve's class of 65 turns out to be the most generous in the history of Colgate. So they turned his class to see if they would help raise money. So yeah, we'll raise the money for it. Name the rank after Steve. But you think about that. 46 years after he died, his friends raised millions of dollars in his name. I'll tell you something about Steve. Now, we all who know Steve, we have our memories about him. And one of my memories about Steve is I'm working for the New York Rangers. My parent, my dad asked me, well, how is it, Mike? He said, yeah, NHL is pretty good. The players are good. They're good guys. Uh, buildings are sold out. I like it. But I said, you know what, Dad? Uh, Steve Riggs, he liked the New York Rangers. That was his, his team. I, you know, I wish Steve was alive. I could invite him down here and practice with us because he'd have no problem going in the ice and practice. And I remember that memory. I mean, telling myself that, you know, he maybe was American when he got a chance, but he was NHL caliber. Um, but we have our memories with Steve because we knew Steve. The people I think about are people who never met Steve. He would have worked with these young people and he, he would have an impact on their lives like he did ours. I'm going to tell you this one story. In the late 70s, I was in Potsdam one summer and met this man, and he said, you know, ask me if I knew Steve. Yeah, I know Steve. We're good friends. And uh, he said, well, I want to tell you this story. We moved to Potsdam in 1959. I had two kids. My son's an outgoing, gregarious guy. My daughter was painfully shy. 
afraid of her shadow. So we took him down to the summer recreation program, the high school which Steve ran, and well, his son had friends right away. His daughter never said anything. About a week or two later, she said to dinner, I beat Steve in ping pong today. We were like, who is Steve? Pretty soon she was asking her mother if she could have some friends come over. So then one day, I went over to pick him up at lunch and went downstairs because it was in the basement of the old high school. There's my daughter, shy as could be, giggling and laughing, playing ping pong with two of her friends and this guy named Steve. We may have new in town, but we knew it was Steve Riggs. Couldn't believe our daughter was friends with Steve Riggs. And then, you know how tough it is to tell your daughter he died in Vietnam? It was a tough deal. It was really tough. It was, tough. It was really a tough thing for a parent. And so we were all lucky to have Steve have friends. We still are. He had impact in all our lives. Um, as an athlete, he had it all. You know, he had it all. He was quick. He could dart. Um, he was fast. The pace picked up. He had no problem. <clears throat> he was strong. You know, you couldn't budge him and stuff. And I want to give you an example of how strong he is. Bill here, I think Bill might remember this. He water ski up in South Colton on the Racket River. And Bill would say, why is this Mike? And he cut back on Steve. And you know what, the, that's where the driver's going to make the guy fall. Steve would just sit back on his skis and grip the handle. And pretty soon the rope would break. And Bill kept doing it. One day he said to Bill, don't you get tired of fixing a ski rope? But maybe our friendship and force can do it. There aren't many people in this room can break that steel. Uh, that gives you an example how strong he was. He had great vision. Great vision. He never blinked. Total concentration. He had passion for the game, whatever it was. Passion for the sport. He had compassion for his teammates. Um, would never be in an area group of the better players and not talking to them. His friends would always be the fourth liners or the and baseball team, the people not playing so much. Just give me one more minute. And um, so the one other story I want to talk about is his pride. I think a baseball game, the ground was hard. They went through his legs in center field. We had to go like, felt like two miles. He came running back, embarrassed, didn't say anything. And I don't know if he won or not, but that night, Occasionally, we'd walk down the Dairy Queen for a banana split that was two blocks from our houses, so he hadn't said a word. So we eating our banana splits, and I uh, sitting there, I said, you know, Steve Buster would have got that ball. And, well, thinking, and I said, you know, we all know he's a better center fielder. That's why we picked him before. And he was kind of happy because not only did he believe Buster was a better center fielder, but it was his best friend. He knew that we really cared about Buster. And so I didn't want to say th three words how to describe Steve. He was humble, very humble, had integrity, lived a life of humility. And I was reading a book not too long ago, I described humility as somebody who thinks of everybody else but not himself. So thank you very much for putting Steve in the Hall of Fame.